I'm going to read from Luke's Gospel, chapter 1. Luke's Gospel, chapter 1. The sort of passage we normally read at Christmas time, and that's a tragedy. Uh, I think, I think uh, the passage we're going to read together right now is a life passage that we should, should come back to time and time again. And we're about to read a passage from verse 26 about a young woman who's not yet a mother, but she is about to become the most famous mother in history. Okay? But she's not a mother yet. She is now given the opportunity to engage with God on a most spectacular journey. And, and even though the subject of our sermon this morning is a woman, these principles apply to everybody in the room. Although she will become a mother, these principles apply to people who are not mothers. In fact, these are principles that apply to anyone who wants to seriously follow Jesus. And that lovely song that we sang earlier on, just, just before I got up, that we offer a hallelujah. Well, here's, here's an example of a young woman offering not just a praise the Lord, not just a hallelujah, but she's offering a whole stack more to Jesus. And I think that's a message to me and you in our 21st century world. So here we go. Luke chapter 1, verse 26 What's lovely about Dr. Luke is that he tells the story of the birth of Jesus entirely from a female perspective. He's really courageous in doing that. If you read Matthew's gospel, the story of the birth of Jesus is told entirely from a male perspective, and there's a reason for that. Luke is deeply courageous in that we get insights into the birth of Jesus that are absolutely beautifully unique and gloriously feminine, and this is one of those moments. Verse 26, Luke chapter 1, in the sixth month, God sent the angel Gabriel to Nazareth to a town in Galilee to a virgin pledged to be married to a man named Joseph, a descendant of David. The virgin's name was Mary. The angel went to her and said, greetings, you who are highly favored, the Lord is with you. Mary was greatly troubled at his words and wondered what kind of greeting this might be. I'm always amazed she was amazed at the greeting and not at the angel. It's just, it's just an interesting thought, isn't it? But the angel said to her, do not be afraid, Mary. You have found favor with God. You will be with child and give birth to a son, and you are to give him the name Jesus. He will be great, and he will be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever. His kingdom will never end. How will this be? Mary asked the angel, since I am a virgin. The angel answered, the Holy Spirit will come upon you and the power of the Most High will overshadow you so that the Holy One to be born will be called the Son of God. Even Elizabeth, your relative, is going to have a child in her old age and she who was said to be barren is in her sixth month. For nothing is impossible with God. Mary said, I am the Lord's servant. May it be to me as you have said. Then the angel left her. Wow, what an amazing story. One of the greatest acts in human history is about to happen. God the Son, the person that John in his gospel calls the Word, is about to become human. And he's about to enter into the theater of human experience in order to become the redeemer of humankind. So God the Son is about to leave heaven. He's about to enter into a human body. And through that humanity, he's going to save the world through his death and his resurrection. And that, that's an amazing idea. And if if the incarnation, God becoming human, makes your head hurt, that's a good thing. It really should make your head hurt. It should make our brain melt a little bit because it's a staggeringly awesome idea. Jesus, the person we know as Jesus, was 100% God and 100% human at the same time. It's an amazing concept. And if, that's way above our pay grade. I, I've studied the Bible all my adult life and I stand looking at the incarnation and my brain still melts. It's just too much for my brain 
to understand. I accept it by faith, but I don't fully understand it. And this incredible moment, what we call the incarnation, is hinging on. The whole plan is dependent on the reaction of a teenage girl. Just think about that for a minute. The creator and sustainer of the world, God Almighty, who we understand as the all-powerful God, has a plan. And this plan's very unique, and this plan's very specific. And for this plan to work, he not only wants the help of a teenage girl, but he needs the help of a teenage girl. That's a staggering idea. There is a sense in which God could just do a whole stack of things on his own. And yet, the plan that he has chosen means, now hear me carefully, don't, don't hear what I'm not saying, God wants this young woman, a young woman in her own culture, but in our culture today, we would class her as a teenager. But not only does he want her, he needs her. And the reaction of this young woman is going to determine the outcome of this plan. Wow. That's just an incredible thought. And there's a sense in which we can look at that story and think, oh, well, that's unique to Mary, right? Because Mary's got a unique call, a unique job. Nothing like this will, has ever happened before, and nothing like this will ever happen again. And all of that is true. But we mustn't stop there. Yes, it is a totally unique story. Never, ever, ever to be repeated in this way. But the idea that God wants you is the same. Come on. The idea that God, can I go even further, needs you hasn't changed. Now, if you're like me, they are remarkable, mind numbing ideas. That the God who created the universe, in my, in my worldview, the God who puts stars in space, the God who the Bible says creates and sustains the whole world by his power, not only does he want me, and I know me, I know who I am, and I, I live with me, and I know the type of person I am, not only does he want me, but at some level, the way he wants to fulfill his plan to the world, he needs me. What? That's an amazing idea, right? And the reason we're not jumping up and down with excitement is because actually most of us deep down, we're a bit, really? Really? Does God really want me? Really me? As I am right now, the person I am right now, does he really want me? Or, or does he want a sort of a cleaned up version, a more perfect version of me, a, a better version of me maybe he would want? But he doesn't want me. Actually, he does want me as I am. Come on. And then in, in expressing his desire to want me, he then says, now John, I've got a plan and the plan is to touch the world with my grace and loving kindness. And to do that, I actually need your help. <laughs> Come on. That's amazing. It is. It, it's a bit of a wow thing. Now, I've been a Christian a million years, and I'm still wowed by that idea. I woke up this morning in my hotel room trying to not wake up the love of my life because I wake up super early. And I, I woke up and I sat in the sort of semi-darkness of my hotel room thinking, wow, who am I that God would want me? Who am I that God would want to use me? Who am I, my goodness, that God would need me? And that's the truth. That's the most staggering idea that we have in the Bible, that we are presented with an amazing God, but an amazing God who has a plan that requires, that needs our cooperation. My goodness. And Mary is one of the most phenomenal examples of that idea. Mary rocks. I love Mary. Mary is an outstanding woman. I would argue she is the greatest human in the Bible. That would be as, I would go as far as that. I would say that Mary is, is like number one example of everything God desires in a human in terms of a willingness 
to surrender herself to what God wants and a willingness to surrender herself to what God needs. And that willingness is summed up in the most amazing words right at the end of this passage. She says, I am the Lord's servant. May it be to me as you have said. Possibly some of the greatest words ever spoken by a human. Incredible. And we just moved past Mary as the woman who had Jesus. But Mary was an amazing woman of God. And she demonstrates to me and you, speaking to us from the first century, she speaks to us in the 21st century and says, look, my circumstances were unique. My story is unique. My story will never, ever, ever, ever be repeated in another human experience. But the principles of my story call out to you today in the 21st century. God wants you and God needs you. Come on now. Come on. Say amen. Come on if you believe that. So as she gives herself, she moves beyond just a hallelujah, which is wonderful. If that's all we can give, that's amazing. But she moves beyond that and she gives three incredible things really quickly that I want to show you from this passage. First of all, Mary gave her body. What an incredible thought. She gave what she had. Look at verse 34. Now, I promised I wouldn't mention sex, but I've just got to reference something here. We'll just move over this quickly, all right? So verse 34, when the angel explains what the Lord wants to do, Mary says, how will this be? How am I going to have a baby since I am a virgin? Now, there's no ambiguity here. By virgin, she doesn't mean just young girl, which is one translation of the word virgin. By virgin, she means sexual virgin. She hasn't had sex with a man, all right? So she's saying to the angel of the Lord, okay, I sort of get the process that God wants to have a baby, but how's that going to happen with me? Because I'm a virgin. I haven't had sex with anybody. And then the angel very explicitly explains how this is going to happen. And if you read it carefully, it's a really beautiful, intimate explanation of how she's going to conceive but she asked the question, how will this be since I am a virgin? Now, here's, here's the tragedy. Many Christians look at Mary and they simply see, forgive my language, please forgive me. They simply see God pursuing a womb. God needs a womb, right? If, if, if Jesus is going to be born and he's going to be born by the, the fusion of, of the Holy Spirit and human seed, which again, mind-blowing, then, then God just needs a womb. And I have met Christians over the years, and they have reduced Mary down to a sort of a human incubator for God. All God needs is a womb. Let's just get this baby born so that this baby can save the world. Now, if you just see Mary like that, you miss a whole stack of amazing stuff. Because God wasn't just attracted to her, I submit to you, because she was a sexual virgin. Now, here's the reason I know that. Well, there's a couple of reasons I know that. Number one, there were thousands of sexual virgins in Israel at the moment of the writing of this text. Thousands. Virginity was a prized idea in Jewish culture. A protected idea, fiercely protected idea. In fact, as we discover in the, in the birth story of Jesus, the hint that Mary was pregnant, not by Joseph, could have got her stoned. So, so this is a, a very, very prized idea, a protected idea. So there were thousands of sexual virgins in the days of Mary. Why her? I, I believe two reasons God is attracted to her because of something in her. I believe that God ends up getting her womb, forgive my language, he ends up getting her womb because he's already got her heart. You see, when, when he has your heart, he can have your womb. If he has your heart, he can have, forgive me, your wallet. When he has your heart, he has your ambitions. When he has your heart, he has the stuff. He's not after your stuff. He's after your heart. He's not after Mary's womb here. He's coming to a young woman who has a heart after him. Now, John, you're just making that up. How do you know this? No, it's in the text. It's very powerful in the text. In fact, in verse 28, the angel comes to Mary and says, Greetings, the one who is favored with grace, the Lord is with you. So there's a sense of favor coming to her. And then in verse 30, you have found favor. 
Now, there's a way of reading that that says, well, you're favored because God's picked you. Or the other way of reading it, actually, God is favoring you because he's attracted to you. There's something in you, forgive my language, that he likes. There's something in you that he wants, your favorite. And it's really interesting that the first reference to favor in verse 28 and the second reference to favor in verse 30 is sandwiched. It's a sandwich, and in between that sandwich is the Lord is with you. So I would suggest to you that this is a young woman who knew the Lord. I would suggest to you that Mary was a young woman who walked with the Lord, and without stretching it too far, I believe she was a young woman who loved the Lord. In other words, the Lord is not just coming to her because she's sexually pure, which is a big, a big tick in the box. It, she has to be sexually pure to be, to be selected for this job, right? But he's, it's not just sexual purity that's attracting him. It's the fact that she knows him, she's walking with him, and she loves him. The Lord is with you. You're favored. This, this young woman was walking with the Lord. Now, if there's any doubt to that, then later on, if we had kept reading, we would come to a beautiful passage that's sometimes called Mary's Song or Mary's Confession or uh, some translations have the Magnificat. I don't know if you've come across that word, the Magnificat. And, and the Magnificat is from verses 46 to verse 55. Most Christians never bother to read it. It's one of the most amazing, theologically saturated, dynamic faith songs in the whole of the Bible. And it's from a woman. And it's from a teenage girl. It's not from a scholar. It's not from a teacher. It's not from one of the cool men around the corner. It's from a young teenage girl, and her song is staggering. Most Christians don't even know that song exists, never mind what the song says. It's an amazing song. And the song is there because I believe it's given us insight, not just into the fact that Mary had a pure womb, but that Mary had a heart after God. That's what he's after. And when you read that, this isn't how it starts. This is the song how it starts. My soul glorifies the Lord and my spirit rejoices in God my Savior for he has been mindful of the humble estate of his servant. From now on, generations will call me blessed for the mighty one has done great, for, great things for me. Holy is his name. And it goes on and on like that. Now, if you didn't know that a teenage girl was reciting that from her heart, She's not reading it off a page. It's not a set prayer that she learned at synagogue. These words are coming out of her heart, which says something about her heart. It's saying something of the type of young woman this is. In, in Mary's world, her Bible, what we call the Old Testament, is sort of in three bits. There's an instruction bit that we call the Torah. There's the prophet's bit. And there's the writings bit. And Mary's song has 15 references to the Old Testament. Two references to the instruction bit. Seven uh, references to the writings bit. And six references to the prophets. Now you're a hard crowd to impress. But I have to say, I have to say, this is staggering. A staggering prayer. She hasn't been to Bible college. She has no formal theological training. She's not a man who would have normal access to the law. She's a woman who would normally be de denied direct access to the Bible. However, she's got the Bible. She's got it through somebody else. Maybe her father. And this young woman now prays a prayer, sings a song, makes a confession with 15 references directly or indirectly to the Old Testament. That's why God came to her. It wasn't just her womb that he was after. He comes to her because he has her heart. Come on now. That's what the Lord's after today. The Lord is not after our stuff. He owns everything. He doesn't need your stuff. Come on. He, he's, not, he's not just after 
The things I can offer, although those things that I can offer are really important, and we should take that seriously. What he's always been after is my heart. If he gets my heart, then all that stuff sort of follows. Everything follows if he has the heart. Let the heart be his. And God comes to her because he has her heart. She gave away her body because she had already given her heart. We will struggle to give God anything if he doesn't have our hearts. All right? Now, I've been in Christian ministry th almost 36 years, and I've heard all the excuses of the day from beautiful Christians objecting to giving stuff to God. Uh, and we can, we can argue practically about the stuff that he's after, but I would, I would suggest that on every occasion I've dealt with that, it's not been about the stuff. It's been about the heart. If he has our heart, the stuff follows. Whatever the stuff is. In this case, it's her body. For you and for me, it could be something else. And it will be something else. But he's after that. Does that make sense? Secondly, she gave her identity. She gave who she was. Look at this, verse 38. She says, in my version of the Bible, she says, I am the Lord's servant. Now, that's a beautiful translation. And what the NIVs tried to do there is explain the words. And this sometimes happens in my and your translation. Sometimes the, the translations we read pick up the ideas literally, and then sometimes the literal doesn't make good poetic sense. So, they, so what the translators do is sort of change the words slightly to make it read or sound better for me and you. So the idea where she says, I am the Lord's servant makes real sense to me and you. But a literal translation, a literal word-for-word -word translation reads like this. Behold, the servant of the Lord. Well, what's the difference? Well, the difference is she doesn't even use the phrase, I am. She sees herself, look at, now listen to this carefully, stay with me. She sees herself not as I am Mary, but she sees herself as the Lord's servant. Wow, that's huge. Dead easy to miss, and especially in my translation, really easy to miss because it's not quite what she's saying. When the angel speaks to her, she says, Behold, the servant of God. And it's an echo of the Old Testament. I mean, the amount of times that people in the Old Testament, like Moses and Samuel, when God calls them, they say, I'm here. And it's literally, whatever you want, you can have. And Mary echoes that. And actually, she doesn't say, I am Mary, the servant of the Lord. She says, behold, the servant of the Lord. She says to the angel, you're looking at a person who identifies themselves not first as Mary. But who identifies herself first. as the Lord's servant. We live in a world today where I am is everything. And unless, please forgive me, I don't want to offend you, unless you're living with your head in the clouds, I am is the dominant mantra of the 21st century world. I am this, I am that, I am the other. And with the declaration of I am is the demand that the world around me respects my I am. Now, I hear that. I understand that. I get all of that. But when it comes to walking with Jesus, here's the challenge. We're being called to surrender my I am to the I am. That one of the challenges of being a Christian is that I come to Jesus fully accepted as the I am I am, I'm John. He wants me as John. He loves me as John. He needs me as John. But in the journey of following Jesus, here's the thing that, that starts to happen. I surrender my I am to thee I am. And here's what I'm saying when I do that. Whoever you are, I will surrender myself to that. It's not just a womb. Come on. 
She's not just a womb. She's not just a wee girl from the back streets of Galilee. She's a serious person. She's a teenager who is old beyond her years. She's a teenager who's caught one of the most dynamic, life-changing principles in the world. That if a human can understand that God loves them, cherishes them, and absolutely is committed to them as the individuals they are, but in the journey of experiencing the Lord in all his fullness, that individual understands that I've got to surrender my I am to the I am. When we discover that, we're truly free. When we discover that, we truly enter into a different world, a world bigger than me, a world beyond me, a world that's not about me, a world that doesn't focus on me all the time, a world that's not about me, but a world that's about him. It's about him. And he's calling me to that world. Now, here's the beautiful thing. When I surrender my I am to the I am, I'm not diminished. I'm not made less. I'm not, I'm not made rubbish. I'm actually enhanced as a person. I end up with more than I would have had if I held on to me. Jesus said, if a man, if a woman would come after me, he, she must deny themselves. Take up their cross and follow me. Luke says, take up your cross every day and follow me. Because if you try to save your life, you'll lose it. But if you lose it, you'll find it. What on earth is all that about? It's about this. It's about this. It's about saying, Lord, I know that if I stay me-centered, my world's going to stay small. But if I surrender my me to you, not only am I going to grow, but the world I influence will grow. And Mary is leading the way. Behold, she says, behold, the Lord's servant. She doesn't even use her own name. She doesn't use the I am mantra. She says, behold, the Lord's servant. I love that. And brothers and sisters, ladies and gentlemen, people listening online, if we can grab that, that's life-changing. And our world wants to say, God, the I am, has to fit into my I am. And God goes, nah, not doing that. He's not. He won't. Ladies and gentlemen, I don't know what way, I don't, I don't care how people dress this up and how much pressure they put on us to sort of have this conversation, but the I am will never fit into my I am. He never will. Never, ever will. There's not a single example of it in the Bible. There will never be an example of it. You and I will not be the exception to the rule. Instead, the rule is surrender my I am to the I am. Come on. Here's the last idea, and I'm done. I'll call the band up in a minute, but not yet. Rachel, where are you? There she is. She's ready. She's like a coil spring. Just give me one minute. And we're done. The third thing that Mary gave away that day was that she gave away her future. She gave away where she was going. Look at the words in verse 38. She says, Behold the Lord's servant, and in this, look at this. May it be to me as you have said. Now, now listen. The minute those words were out of her mouth, her future changed. Whatever she thought her future was going to be, those words changed it. And here's what she was doing. Here's what this gorgeous, beautiful, spiritual follower of God grasped as a teenager. She grasped the idea of giving away her future to the safe and capable hands of God. Because the minute she says yes to this, her whole world is about to change. She is about to go somewhere as a human where no human has ever been before. No human in the whole of human history has been where this young girl is about to go. No human has ever been made pregnant by God. God has helped humans to get pregnant through other humans. 
He's opened barren wombs and made women capable of having children that didn't have. That story runs through the whole of the Bible. But there's no record of God making a human pregnant until this moment. Think about that. Think about that. Think about what Mary's saying is to think about Mary having to explain this to Joseph. I'm pregnant. And Joseph, we know from Matthew, wants to divorce her quietly because he's a righteous man. Doesn't want her publicly shamed. Doesn't, certainly doesn't want her executed, stoned. So he's going to divorce her quietly. And, and you know, he's trying to reach for an explanation. Who made you pregnant? Well, God. Hey, even 21 centuries later, that's weird, right? Like seriously, that's just weird. In the first century world, it would have sounded like the teenage girl had lost her mind. And she knew it. She knew that the minute this happened, that her world would think something about her that wasn't true. She was immoral, that she was dirty. That she had broken her vows to God. And the opposite is actually the case. She's a pure moral heart. She loves Jesus. And in fact, she's obeying God. She's not disobeying God. She's obeying God. But the whole world would see her as the woman who got pregnant before she got married. That rumor hung around all her life. And she carried it with dignity. When Mary said yes, she put her life physically in danger. Literally carrying a baby is a, although it's a routine issue today for, for us, it's a very dangerous thing too. She put her life in danger in terms of her relationship with Joseph. She could have lost the man she was betrothed to be married to, which was a big deal in first century Israel. And she could have literally lost her life. She could have been taken out the back by a gang of men and quietly stoned. She knew all that when she said, may it be to me, she said. That's why she's amazing. Come on, that's why she's amazing. As Protestants, we shouldn't worship her, but we should honor her. She's not the mother of God, God is eternal, but she's the mother of Jesus, who is the Savior of the world. And when she said yes, she gave her future away, knowing that it would never look like she thought it would look. And the rest, as they say, is history. A little, young, insignificant teenage girl in the back streets of Nazareth has become the most famous woman in the world. Because she surrendered to the Lord. That's what he's after. And what he did for Mary and what he did with Mary and what he did through Mary, he'll never do again. But the way he approached Mary and what he was after from Mary and how he engaged with Mary, how he parted with, with, with Mary, those ideas remain identically the same for us in the 21st century. And Mary, what did she do? She gave away her body. Why? Because he had her heart. Mary surrendered her identity. Why? Because she understood his identity. And Mary gave away her future. Why? Because she trusted the maker of heaven and earth to look after her. Do you want to come now? And... On this beautiful day that we celebrate mums, I hope the mums in the room are loved and honored and respected today, but this message comes to us all. That there are some amazing ideas here that speak to us all today in the 21st century. The God who made heaven and earth wants you. Not the perfect version, 
Not the cleaned up version. Not the person you'd like to be, but the person you are right now. He wants you. The second amazing idea is that he needs you. He needs you to be his hands and his feet to the world. He needs you to carry his grace and his loving kindness to the world. He needs you, wherever you are, to embrace that invitation to engage in that partnership agreement with him and say, Lord, I will surrender my I am to your I am. And ladies and gentlemen, let me say this from the example of Mary. Whatever you surrender to him, it is safe in his hands. He is faithful. He is good. He is committed to you. He is committed to his works in you and he will never abandon the works of his hands in you. But he calls to you like he calls to Mary. Mary, I want you. Mary, I need you. And Mary, a teenage girl from Nazareth, utters some of the greatest words a human has ever spoken. And may they become our words. Behold, the Lord's servant. May it be to me as you have said. Will you stand with me if you can? Let me pray for you. The Lord got Mary's womb because the Lord had Mary's heart. If you forget everything I've said, remember that one idea. He got her womb. He got her identity. He got her future. He didn't take it. That would be a different conversation entirely. He didn't take Mary. She gave herself to him. And when Mary surrendered, she allowed, can I say that reverently, the Lord to do something truly spectacular in her life and through her life. And so, Lord, I pray for every person in this room and I pray for every person connecting with us online. That, Lord, as we look at the story of Mary, an ancient story, a story that seems so far away from our world, I pray that our hearts will be open to hear these incredible truths, O oh Lord. I pray that like Mary, Lord, you will have our hearts. I pray like Mary, Lord, you will have our identity. I pray like Mary, Lord, you will have our future. I pray that, Lord, we will embrace this amazing idea that you want us and you need us. And Lord, I pray for every one of the people in this room, whatever stage of this journey we are on, that Mary will speak to us, that you will speak to us through Mary's voice from this first century story. And that Lord, in our 21st century world, we will see you move in us. We will see you move through us and we will see you move for us in Jesus' name. Lord, we say from our hearts, behold, the Lord's servant, may it be to me as you have said. Amen.